it sounds to me like marketing is something we all do. Because you mentioned that whenever you hire talent, that's marketing. And the way you interact with your employees and your customers, replying to a bad review, good or bad, is marketing. And it dawned on me, hold on, so that means that I'm walking down the road and I see a beautiful girl. And I want to know a beautiful girl. The way I present myself is also marketing, which means that there is a right way and a wrong way to go about marketing. Can you give us some tips and advice on that? This is a bit of a controversial topic, but when I work with people in marketing, I like to be as transparent as possible about the reality of, of their business because ultimately everything costs and you want to return from it. I see a lot of companies thinking that marketing is their silver bullet. They can have a fancy website, they can run some ads, and then all of their problems about getting customers and making money will disappear. But that's not the case. Marketing is usually started this charity called the Reforestation Fund, which that was pivotal because actually separating, trying. So before that, with Manuka Essentials, I was trying to combine business and helping the environment into one thing. You buy a bottle of skin oil and you're creating demand for a native plant, which then uh, creates reasons to plant native forest. So they were connected. Best thing uh, something like that. Yeah, and then we can invest in planting trees, etc. But the problem with that was that connecting those two things meant that um, one, people seemed to think that I was greenwashing, that I was trying to make money off helping the environment and that uh, I wasn't in it for the right reasons, which isn't true, but I could see how they got to that. Um, two, it meant that it, it's easy to put your profit priorities over your environmental priorities. And I thought, let's just split yes, this out. conflict of interest. Yeah. How would you go about using content marketing in your charity and not only in your charity but how does it also help clients of yours to improve their business not just revenues but brand recognition and customer loyalty etc now content marketing can get very complex and it takes many different forms it could be social media blogs podcasts youtube videos press releases email marketing lead magnets downloads even i like to think of ads as content marketing because that ad is content landing page you go to is also content even if it's in a sales capacity so it's very broad reaching hey guys welcome to another episode of the boardroom podcast today column Armstrong joins us. Callum, where are you located at this time? So I'm in the New Zealand in the deep south. Uh, I think it's the southernmost oh. major landmass in the world. And I'm in a small town called Rotorua. So we have a lot of ge geothermal activity here, um, a lot of funny smells, a lot of hot pools. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm really excited to be on your podcast. So thank you for having me, Jabez. You're the first person in Jamaica I've met. <laughs> I think you're one of the... Perhaps not the first, but one, well, first three persons I've met from New Zealand. I met a Brazilian in New Zealand before, which is just not a place you expect to meet a Brazilian, but here we are. Yeah. I am I'm excited to have you on today because you mentioned a few things. You mentioned your charity, where you have your charity that has a podcast where people come on, talk about things that they're doing to help nature. We all live on Earth. I think we have a vested interest in Earth working well for us, right? I also learned that you founded and started six companies. Some of them you've exited, including the charity. You're still in the charity, but that's one that you started. And your area of expertise is actually B2B content marketing. Now, you mentioned also, and this is where I'm going to be very, very controversial for many people. You mentioned that maybe just maybe we shouldn't start marketing right now because you know what? Marketing is causing us our actual results. So how exactly does that happen where you're marketing, but you're marketing at the wrong time, perhaps, and because of that, it's costing you? Yeah, so great question. Um, this is a bit of a controversial topic, but when I work with people in marketing, I like to be as transparent as possible about the reality of, of their business because ultimately everything costs and you want to return from it. In the types of clients I serve, they are typically B2B services, so they solve problems for other businesses. Now, I see a lot of companies thinking that marketing is their silver bullet. 
they can have a fancy website, they can run some ads, and then all of their problems about getting customers and making money will disappear. But that's not the case. Marketing is usually pretty much always amplifying your message. It's amplifying your value. It's amplifying your service. If you don't have the right foundations in your business, marketing is likely to cause more problems than solutions. When you invest in marketing at the right time, however, it can be such a great asset and it can be really a powerful thing to grow your business. Um, so typically I say, firstly, are you doing a good job of serving your customers? Do you know their problem? Do you know why they're coming to you? Do you know their pain points, their journey, the consequences of not solving it, the alternatives, uh, what they actually like in your service? Uh, if you do that well and you're serving your customers well, they, they'll stick around, they'll refer to refer you to others, they'll be happy, and that's a good foundation for your business. After that, are you actually closing customers? When you get a lead, are you do you have a clear process to turn them into a customer? Are you able to go out and get customers manually if you need to? Because marketing can take time. And so then after you've got those foundations in place, are you able to take on more clients? Do you have the capacity to grow? Do you have the staff or the ability to hire, train staff? Do you have the systems in place? Do you have um, do you have the structures to actually grow? Because there's no point doubling your business, your client base if you're going to fall flat on your face. So these are some considerations to think about before you invest into marketing. And if you do that right, then you can really set yourself up for the long term. It sounds interesting because what I'm hearing is that marketing is a lot more than um, placing ads on Facebook or Google, for example. You have to you have to have something worth selling. It reminds me of what Seth Godin says. He says that you should have marketing involved in the process of building your product or service from day one because marketing is going to be what helps you make the product or service that solves the problem. I am curious, how did you arrive at this conclusion that perhaps, perhaps, perhaps there is a right time and a wrong time, a right way and a wrong way for doing marketing? Yeah, so I have always cared about my customers in my own businesses and when I'm serving clients and their customers. And I think it's, it's an organic growth of how I've arrived at this conclusion. But I, w I would say the key word here is empathy and really being empathetic about what's going on for the people we're seeking to serve, in the words of Seth Godin. Um, and, and that's grown naturally over time. But the more I get into marketing, the more I find that there's value that you provide to people and that is solving their problems. And there's leverage of how you're getting that in front of more people, how you're multiplying that value. And a lot of people go into the leverage space. Can we get in front of 10,000, 10, 100,000, a million people through ads? Can we get on top of Google with that SEO? Can we in implement this new tactic? But they don't think about the value. And the value comes back to the empathy because for most businesses, you're solving a problem for your customer. That problem's not always obvious. Um, an accountant might be making your tax return go away and, and saving you taxes, but it might be less obvious for some, such as a restaurant. What, sol what problem are they solving? They're, they're providing a, a social space for people to be. They're providing delicious food to fill your stomach, and they're providing a way to connect with friends and family or colleagues. So I think it's important to really ask, why are people showing up? Look, I'm a different person talking to you to when I see my partner. I'm a different person to when I'm delivering content for a client. Um, it's We are all different people in different times of the day. Every relationship has a different purpose. And I think you need to get to the core of why is this relationship with your customers happening before you can go to anything else. Otherwise, you risk just putting noise out into the ether without signal. Putting noise out into the ether without sticking. You know what's quite fascinating about what you said? It sounds like you have a well-thought-out strategy that's been developed and honed over time. How did you get into marketing? Where did you actually start? Is it as an intern? Did you go to college or uni? Was it an online course maybe? Perhaps you had a company and you're like, you know what? I need to start getting customers. How do I get customers? Oh, marketing. Well, let's do that. So how did you get yeah. into it? Yeah, so I've got to go back to the beginning for that. Uh, I used to be... A child. I think we all used to be children, actually. <laughs> but, um, 
Yeah, but I've always been into science. I've always been into the environment. I've always been curious. My mum used to say that I asked 100 million questions and uh, it annoyed a lot of my teachers because they just wanted me to write what was on the whiteboard. And, um, and so whilst I was so curious, my father was a business owner. He used to run a, a medium-sized company and then in my teenage years, he started his own company selling floor coverings of all things and it's carpets, vinyls, carpet tiles, and a few other items. And throughout that time, whenever I saw him, he would tell me about what was going on in his business. He would tell me about what was working and what wasn't working. And that kind of swayed my development in my teenage years towards marketing and away from science. I, I wanted to be a shark biologist, of all things. Um, and I decided to follow in dad's footsteps. He had studied marketing, he had become a salesman, and he had turned into a manager and business owner. So I went and studied marketing, and I got my degree in marketing. Um, and yeah, that, that got me into it. But as I, as I did my, went through my life, I, I sold carpet for a few years, and, and I, I found this love for the environment, for nature, for our forests, our mountains, our oceans, our wetlands, our lakes our rivers. And when I, when I left that job, I went overseas. And during that time, I discovered this, uh, this plant called Manuka. You may have heard of Manuka honey. It's, it's really big at the moment. Uh, but this plant is native to New Zealand, my homeland. And it plays a key role in bringing native forest back to the country. When you plant it in the ground, it, it creates canopy cover and, and allows other native plants to grow and attracts birds that bring seeds and all that great stuff. Um, and I found that there was this bioactive that had powerful healing properties. So I started this business, which was called Manuka Essentials. Um, I sold that last year. I'm no longer involved in it. But in running that business, uh, well, the idea was that I would, if we could create demand for native plants, then we could bring native forest back to the country. But I was funding it all myself, no investors, and I had to pay for, for my way. So I got a job writing blogs, well, self-employed writing blogs for a friend, and he started an, a marketing agency. And then that turned into um, one client, and then other people asked me, and it, it kind of just snowballed from there. Lockdown hit in 2020, as we all know. Uh, my skincare business, which was Manuka Essentials, that uh, was considered non-essential, so I had to stop it. And the clients I was serving got great results. So they said, why don't you build a marketing agency? So, and we'll give you all our business. So I started this agency, Paste and Publish. We got to about nine people, 19 members in, in the following 18 months. And it grew quite a lot, but I found that I wanted to be a coach because, and I wanted to do strategy and I wanted to help people to build their own capabilities. Because when people came to work for us, came to hire us as as um as a vendor as a service provider we would provide them with a blog we would provide them with monthly work that would get them to the top of google that would grow their email list that would get them customers but ultimately if we ever stopped our relationship they would only have the deliverables and i was busy managing lots of people and it was quite stressful so i decided if i became a coach i could well one i could learn more i could get a lot deeper and have more time to think and really really understand things in a much deeper level yeah. two mm -hmm. i could provide value to people so I, I could provide lasting value so that if we continue working together our work grows your business and grows your skill set and your capabilities but if we stop you're still set up for the long term and um, three, it's just a lot more fun. So I transitioned to a coach. It's still called Paste and Publish, but now it's a lot smaller and it's just me and a few others. So yeah, sorry, that's the long story of how, how I got into it, but yeah. That's the best story. It reminds me of Robert Kiyosaki with his rich dad, where it would be growing up, his dad would be talking to him about business and entrepreneurship and what he's doing and how it's working. I don't think he ever mentioned what didn't work, which is strange. Yeah, he mentioned all of that. And in your story, it also helped you to find your place where you are now. I know you remember, I know you said that you love science and you still love science. I mean, given the name of the company you started and everything, right? But I am also understanding that it was your natural curiosity and love for helping people because the core thing that you said was that I love my clients, I love my customers, and you want to help them. And when they suggested that, you know what? COVID may have shut you down for the skincare company, I believe it was. Yeah, that opened up later, but that was the one that closed, yeah. Yeah, because of COVID and the lockdowns and everything. Yeah. And we're like, hey, you know what? 
start a marketing agency. We will give you all the business. And you did that for them. Do you ever think that perhaps going ahead with that decision was like a turning point in your life or one of those pivotal decisions that help you form your identity for who you are today? And if given the chance, would you have chosen differently? Mm. So to unpack mm. that, I didn't actually want a marketing agency. I had people asking me to start <laughs> one for probably a year or two before that. And I just kept saying, no, I'm not interested. I do excellent work. I don't want to be responsible for other people's output. And uh, when this happened, the numbers I was seeing that people were offering me, I thought, well, I've never seen this amount of income before. And I've got no income from elsewhere. I may as well start it. So I, I but in that moment, I said 5% of our revenue at the time, we will, um, we will use to pay our team to do free environmental work to help environmental charities, which is conservation is my reason for being. Um, but at that time, I seemed to have a crazy spurt of starting lots of things. Uh, I was, I thought, you know, having lots and lots of things going was a mark of success. And I, I really just went head first. So I started this charity called the Reforestation Fund, which that was pivotal because actually separating, trying. So before that, with Manuka Essentials, I was trying to combine business and helping the environment into one thing. You buy a bottle of skin oil and you're creating demand for a native plant, which then um, creates reasons to plant native forest. So they were connected. Uh, invest in stuff like that. Yeah, and then we can invest in planting trees, etc. But the problem with that was that connecting those two things meant that um, one, people seem to think that I was greenwashing, that I was trying to make money off helping the environment and that I, I wasn't in it for the right reasons, which isn't true, but I can see how they got to that. Um, two, it meant that it, it's easy to put your profit priorities over your environmental priorities. And I thought, let's just split yes, this out. Conflict of interest. Yeah, I need money to to live, to, to grow, to do this stuff. But I also need this purpose because this is why I'm here. So I split that out and paste and publish. We would say, well, here's the money we've received and we just give set aside this 5% and we'll just use that to do good. And we don't have to make a profit off it. And in our charity, we said, well, that's fine. This charity is here to, at the time it was to plant native trees and we've done some of that. Now it's called Conservation Amplified and we have a podcast called People Helping Nature that raises awareness for charities, um, environmental projects and people that are helping nature. But that is separate. You know, my business funds and finances it, but it's separate to my business. I don't say to people, come and do business with me so that I can help the environment, although I do help the environment. It, it's separate. So I think a pivotal moment was understanding that, yeah, we can separate these things out and they can be different compartments in life. Um, but then, yeah, I, I kind of jumped into lots of things at that point. I opened a retail shop in, in town with selling wellness products. I yeah, did that. I, um, did a lot of stuff that kept me really busy. So at that point I worked for like 80 to 90 hour weeks for a couple of years and um, grew, you know, had a lot of financial success and a lot of business success on the outside, but I was just so burnt out, which is what led to becoming a coach and also led to changing the charity to using my skills and content to actually help the environment. You're one that continues to grow and evolve. I like that. I appreciate that. I respect that. And you've also mentioned something that I was curious about because you said that you had a skincare company. And the idea behind the skincare company was that you have skincare, you're using a plant. By increasing the demand for the plant, it will lead to better investment, better conditions, and you know a better future for the plant because now it's a, a commercially... Um, viable product or commercially helpful. I'm pretty sure how to say that, which is strange. But you quickly realize that the wrong conclusion was being drawn because now they're saying, aha, you're trying to profit off the environment. You're not necessarily trying to help. And even though that wasn't true, you understood where they were coming from. And the other part, which is also, and perhaps even more difficult to deal with, is the conflict of interest. Here's where things get tricky, though, because I know you're into marketing. I know how you got to market. I know you're still active in your charity if you had to choose only one. So money was not an issue, right? Or is not an issue in this scenario. Money is not an issue. You get all the funding you need. If you could only choose one to work on for 60, let's say 70 hours per week for the next 10 years, would it be the charity? 100%. Or would it be marketing? 
Yeah, Ricky again. Charity, hands down, no doubt. Oh, um, I love serving clients. I love helping businesses to grow, but mm-hmm. in a heartbeat, if I had unlimited funding and I could do this, I would, because if we can get millions of people passionate and active in nature, we can change the world and we can give the future that our children and grandchildren deserve. And that comes above any business interest. Um, if you're listening to this, you might think, well, this guy sounds like some green hippie that I never want to do business with. Um, but yeah. I believe in transparency and that's you asked. So that that's the truth. I will be here for nature. I'm pretty sure there may or there might be someone who thinks that, but I think that most people would admire and respect um, the honesty and transparency. And the other part of it is that, like I said, we all at some point have to live on Earth. So it probably is in our best interest to ensure Earth is working at 100% <laughs> as best as Absolutely. possible. Definitely. I mean, you know what's quite interesting? A lot of times in those doomsday movies, so this is going to be ever a weird podcast episode. We're talking business, we're talking philanthropy, I know we're talking movies. Let's go there. All in right. those um, right. science fiction movies... It normally starts with a person who says, this is a concern. Let's work on this. The masses say, nah, shut up. We don't want anything to do with this. We prefer to do what we've always been doing. And eventually it gets to a place where the masses are like, ah, that one guy was right. But here's why I mentioned this. Your bravery is admirable. Your leadership is admirable because you're doing something that at the moment is not very popular. There is a company, so you may know this company, it's called um, Green Geeks. They're a web hosting company. Green and uh, what they've really? done is that, they, I think the deal, I'm not certain, but I'll look it up and I'll display it on screen. I think the deal that they had was for every person that signs up to their company, they plant um, one tree in return. And I think that's admirable. I think that's respectable because I always say this, 99% of the problems in the world will be solved by entrepreneurship. And the environment is no different. The unfortunate thing is, and I have a charity with my brother dedicated to my mother. I learned this the hard way. Whenever you want to do philanthropical efforts, so people love to say they are philanthropists and they help people. No, they don't. They love the attention they get from helping people. And that's a sad thing. Whenever you want to help someone, you do a lot better when you're able to help yourself. And you're not depending on someone to allow you to help other people. Meaning that you're not depending on funding from someone to get your initiative going. I heard you say that you worked for a few years, two, three years, 80, 90 hours per week, just getting things going, led to burnout. And that's where you transitioned to the coaching role that you now have. It's a bit more manageable. What are some of the telltale signs that you're perhaps working too much? Because I know hustle culture is out there. And you know the dreams and the goals. So what are some of the telltale signs that you know you're perhaps putting in too many hours? Take a step back for a while. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, before answering that, I just want to touch on two points that you said. Um, one was that you need to feed yourself first, and people like the the idea of being a philanthropist, but a lot of it is smoke and mirrors. I think you've got a really good point there, and this is why I run businesses is because it means that I can feed myself while doing the good stuff. Um, but I also see in this environmental space, and it may be the same in other nonprofit sectors, but uh, there are so many people that can't afford to buy a house that are really struggling to put enough food on the table for their kids because they decide to do this work and they are earning so little money because the funding isn't there. So therefore they follow their heart, but, their family suffers. Um, and I take my hat off to them. It's very admirable, but it's it, it shouldn't be that way. And um, just another quick note is you said about Green Geeks planting a tree for every every customer. I think that's awesome. And I think we should really celebrate these businesses. But I also think that as consumers, as buyers, we have a responsibility to ask more questions. Where is that tree? Where's it going? Is that tree native to that ecosystem? Has it been sourced to put in that ecosystem after the tree has been planted? Is it going to be looked after so that pests and predators don't eat that tree? Is that tree planted in the right season or is it done for the lowest cost basis? And um, I'd love, I will have a look at Grand Geeks afterwards. I don't know how they work, but I think that's partly on companies to educate, but I think it's also on consumers to actually ask 
and be curious. And not everyone has to care. If you don't care, that's fine. You don't care. But if you do care, I think it's worth just nudging that curiosity a bit further. Um, to answer your your question, though, uh, how do you see telltale signs that you've got burnout? Hmm. So my thoughts on this are, firstly, you are working all hours. That's an obvious one. But that you're constantly apologizing to loved ones for not spending time with them, that, you know, they're, they're waiting, you might be canceling plans and then you, you've always got a good excuse that works there. And it feels like a very noble excuse. Sorry, I've got to work, but, but um, it becomes a habit. And if your friends start stop inviting you out for things, cause they know you won't be available or your, your partner stops trying to go on dates with you or, um, stops trying to be active with you if your kids ask where why you don't spend time with them those are those are very obvious signs I think um, other ones are that it's hard to sleep at night that you're waking up in the night stressed um, that you are you're maybe snapping at people because you don't have enough sleep um, and and if you're running your own business and you're in that stage of burnout, especially if you're in a small company, it's not always as easy as just quitting and just making some rash changes because you've got continuity that you need to give. Um, I, you need to make sure that you have a, a rational plan that you can work out of and that you create time for yourself for sleep, uh, that type of thing. For me, getting a naturopath, getting a life coach and doing daily exercise was one of the biggest changes I made. But what about you, Jabez? What do you see as the telltale signs of burnout and what advice would you give? I would have to say that the telltale sign of burnout is if you're working, too much is not a good word, but you're working at such a rate that your mind, your body, and your relationships can't keep up. Now, here's the thing. Managing expectations, right? So I'll, I'll put it out there, right? I am not going to be the husband, the father, or the friend that's going to be at every birthday party, every family event, home by 5, at home in the morning at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. That's just not me. I don't want that life. I'm not going to live that life. But I will be there when it matters most. Here's an example. Let's say as a father, you're running a company. Let's say you have 10, 12 employees. It doesn't have to be Fortune 500, right? We're all people here. You have 10, 12 employees. It's a garage in town. And because you're the head guy, you're the one that clients come to. You are trained a few um, employees and stuff like that. So it's a lot of hours. By the way, guys, if you hear thunder, and you're not going to hear the lightning, but if you hear thunder in the background, we're having a storm in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. It's no longer sunshine and beaches right now. <laughs> so you might not want to be here. So excuse the sound, the background interference, please. But yes, you have responsibilities at work, right? You're not going to be able to be there for dinner every evening at 5 p.m. Perhaps mm -hmm. at 5 p.m. when the business closes, that's when you're getting to do your tasks, your job, looking over the financials, etc. And the reason why I bring this up is because you don't want to go into the relationship with your partner, your spouse, you don't want to have children, and not say to them that this is who I am and this is what my life is like. When they go into the relationship and they understand this, it makes it a lot easier to navigate. But you also don't want to, you know, overstep your bounds. You don't want it to be every single evening. You want to be there sometimes. And the other thing is that it's going to teach your kids responsibility, accountability, commitment, and nothing beats being able to keep the lights on, put clothes on your back and food on the table, right? So I think overwork, overworking, it's, it's not something that I can say if you're working 13 hours, it's bad. It has to be subjective. It has to be based on you and on your circumstance. And it is not productive for you to spend 80, 90 hours at the office, leave your wife and kids at home. If you're going to have to spend 80, 90 hours at the office, and I know this isn't really answering the question about what is, but it's also like offering solutions. Yeah, that's great. Have them come over every now and again. Have dinner at the office with them. Let the kids, after they get home from school, change into casual wear, come to the office. You're a mechanic, for example. Teach them about cars. Teach them about daddy's job. Teach them about this worker and what this worker does. Have them meet the other workers' kids. You don't have to be home to be present, right? And when you're home, be home. Don't take work home. Don't be at home yapping about the business. Of course, it's important. Mm. But wait for them to ask. Wait for the kids to go to bed. 
and say to your partner, I'd like to talk to you about something that's happening at work. It's now a good time. And allow them to say no. Allow them to say maybe tomorrow evening and be respectful of that. Because the thing that we don't want to do, which is what we as entrepreneurs sometimes fall into the trap of, we overdo it for now and we forget later. And because we're afraid of overdoing it now, we underdo it now and then that leads to regret. So while overworking it's something that, you know, you're burned out and you're doing too much, if you're working 15 hours and you're perfectly fine, maybe you're not you're not doing it too much. If no one is suffering, if you're if you can be there in an emergency, if you're there enough for everyone that everyone's happy, they know your face, they know your jokes, they know your tendencies then maybe you're doing just fine. I think that's really good advice. I, I wish someone told me that five years ago. <laughs> You've got some really good points about managing expectations and about you know the amount of work you do is subjective. Um, one point you did mention was it teaches your children the value of hard work and, and discipline. And my mother was a single mother growing up um, from when I was seven, Same. and, and um, she works so hard. She worked a full-time job. She studied part-time. She played sport, looked after me, cooked and cleaned, and somehow had a life. And I was, at you know, at the time she, well, later on she said I thought I was a bad mother. Um, but then, you know, I learned I worked my butt off because I saw her as an example. And, uh, you know, just seeing her success now, she's she's made so much out of her life and, She's inspired me to do so much as well. And yeah, hindsight's a great thing, isn't it? I know, right? And um, hats off to your mom. Not yeah. only to the single mothers, but single parents out there. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. Your kids are proud of you. 100%. 100%. Content marketing, getting clients, raising awareness. I see this as a viable solution and approach to your love for the environment. How would you go about using content marketing in your charity? And not only in your charity, but how does it also help clients of yours to improve their business? Not just revenues, but brand recognition, um, customer loyalty, etc. Yeah, so content marketing is a long play. It's not a throw a bunch of money at ads and get some results and get some data and double down on what works. It does work, but it does take longer. Um, there's, there's, a few, there's a few things to think about here. So I'll first touch on for a business, how content marketing can help. And then I'll go into what we're doing in our charity. For a business, uh, content marketing, I like to think of as educating your customers, entertaining them, inspiring them. But we have a buying pathway. We go, no matter what we buy, we go from being unaware that we have a problem to being problem aware, to looking for solutions, being aware of a solution, and then being ready to buy that solution. And then we go through the buying process and become a customer and we might stick around, we might not. So in content marketing, a big part of what we do is we identify what are those concerns, those questions, those considerations at each stage of the buying process. And then understanding where are you, where are, where are your customers looking? Where do you want to show up? And where do you want to show up as business in terms of what works for you, your time, your personality, your, your market and your investment and what you can invest. And so then looking at that, we can say, let's cover these topics because that's going to help our customers. It's going to educate them and it's going to support them along their journey of solving their problem through us. And I like to think of content marketing as being generous because you provide the answers on a silver platter and you invite them that if they want to get it done easier or whatever your offer is, then come have a chat. Now, content marketing can get very complex and it takes many different forms. It can be social media, blogs, podcasts, YouTube videos, press releases, email marketing, lead magnets, downloads. Even I like to think of ads as content marketing because that ad is content. And the landing page you go to is also content, even if it's in a sales capacity. So it's very broad reaching. But I, I think... I like to think of content marketing as building a house versus renting a market stall. When you build a house, you put the foundations in place and you build on top of it. And, and as you live in your home for for years, decades and generations, you you invest in your property. You, you might build a, 
a, a side wing to your house or a, or a, um, a sleep out. You might make your garden nice. You might have a water feature or a swimming pool, depending on what, what you're into. Um, and, and I think that's a good way of looking at content marketing is when you start, you're setting the foundations. Imagine that you're a business and you just have a website and it just has a few pages. Here's what we do. Here's our homepage. Here's our services or products and um, maybe one or two other pages. And that's like a, a little shack on the side of the road. And as you invest in your content, you're investing in improving and building that house. So answering those core foundational questions for your customers, uh, looking at their considerations when they're looking for solutions, looking at the problems and answering their problems so that they can then find the solutions and then linking that all up. And as you get lots more content, it becomes more of an ecosystem, like the nature that I'm about to talk about, uh, because in an ecosystem, everything feeds into each other. And I, I have clients that we've done blogging, for example, for years and years and years. And now we have a library of hundreds of blogs. And whenever we write a new blog, every second paragraph seems to link to another article. And when you read one article, you jump into the ecosystem and all your questions are answered because we've answered every question you can think of. Well, not everyone because we're still creating content. But uh, that is the difference is it's really, it can be hard to grasp if you haven't considered content in the past. But if once you get it, it's like night and day when you think about your online presence. That's beautiful. And I heard the key word you said that content, it's like business, it's like the environment, you're building an ecosystem. And the way that I love, so for, sorry, for all of our listeners or viewers, there's something interesting that you must be made aware of as it relates to content marketing and marketing in general. There are two ways you can go about marketing. You can go about marketing by being interruptive. And that's where the ads come in. So you're watching a TV, basketball game, or meeting up with the Kardashians. Is that what it's called? The Kardashians? I don't, I don't know. know. Series, don't Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, Everybody Game of knows Thrones. Game of Thrones, yeah. right? Yeah. And an ad comes up for a new SUV. And the person that runs this ad has just interrupted your show to sell you something, to make you aware of something. Not the best way to go about marketing. It gets you results, but there is a more interesting way, which is by doing outbound mar inbound marketing. Inbound marketing, which is not interruptive, is you put the content out there for someone who is problem ignorant. They don't know they have the problem. They're problem aware. They're searching for a solution. They're searching for the right solution for them and so on. You put the solution out there by educating your prospects. And the reason why this works is because when you go to the doctor, you say to the doctor, I have a terrible headache, I'm a little bit dizzy, and my eyes are red. The doctor can say, okay, what else are you experiencing? These are the symptoms. This is perhaps what is wrong. This is why it has gone wrong. Take this medication, do this amount of days of rest, make these changes, and this is what's going to happen. You trust the doctor because the doctor has helped you understand the problem. And this is how you go about marketing. This is how you go about getting clients, building a relationship. You teach them about the problem, you become the voice of authority. Now, the ecosystem of business. I know that, Callum, you are very experienced in business and marketing. You started six, you're in marketing, you understand the environment very well. Where exactly does marketing fit into the ecosystem of business? Is it a department that you put over at the corner of the building, they stay by, stay by themselves and everybody else does what they're doing? Or are you supposed to be integrated into your day-to-day -day operations and business making and decision making, sorry? I'd like to answer that with two points. One is a book I read called This Is Marketing by Seth Godin. And another one came from a paper I did at university. And they formed this understanding that back in the day, back when marketing was just a department of a business, that's all it was. It was the department that was there to advertise so that the salespeople could go and sell their product. It was the factory makes something and the marketers put some pretty ads for it. Uh, I sometimes get mocked calling uh, being called the coloring in department and that is a great way of thinking about it where they're just to color in pictures. Um, and that was that was the extent of marketing. I like to think of that the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe even into the 70s and 80s. As technologies develop, as customer expectations have increased and distrust of 
marketing and our business has increased, the role of marketing has really become much wider reaching. And I like to think, like you say, marketing pervades every part of your business. It infiltrates all of your business. When your customer service team is serving your clients, how they treat your customers is marketing. When someone leaves a review and you you respond to it, well or bad, that might be customer service, but that's actually marketing. How your salespeople treat your potential customers is marketing. How your fulfillment team or um, in the case of a B2C product business, your uh, the delivery of how they unbox your product, that is marketing. How your product or your service is designed is marketing because are you marketing to solve their problems or to sell something? How your management structure attracts and retains your staff is marketing because you're still marketing to attract talent. And if you attract the wrong talent, you're going to have give your customers a terrible experience, which is bad marketing. If you uh, attract talent, and you don't treat them right, and that talent leaves, and they say, don't work for this company, that's bad marketing. If you treat your staff well, that's good marketing. Um, I, I could go on, but I think though that kind of answers, answers that marketing has to be considered at every point. There are parts of your business that marketing doesn't come into, but I think most parts are there. Yeah. Um, what do you think? It sounds to me like marketing is something we all do. Because you mentioned that whenever you hire talent, that's marketing. And the way you interact with your employees and your customers, replying to a bad review, good or bad, is marketing. And it dawned on me, hold on. So that means that I'm walking down the road and I see a beautiful girl. And I want to know a beautiful girl. The way I present myself is also marketing, which means that there is a right way and a wrong way to go about marketing. Can you give us some tips and advice on that? Yeah, let's come back to that beautiful girl. So if you went to that beautiful girl and you said, hey, do you want to marry me? I'm Jabez. She's probably going to walk away thinking, who who on earth are you? She's not going to think it's great. And I so often see businesses, especially in cold email and cold phone calling, that think that it's fine to go from not knowing me and me not knowing you to, will you buy our product? Buy it now, I've got a discount. And that is an example of terrible marketing. Remember, your customers are going through a journey. Just the same with that beautiful girl. If you wanted to make her your wife, first you're going to say, you're going to open up with a nice line. Hey, you know, really, I'm, I'm terrible with that pickup lines. But, you know, you're going to open the conversation. You're going to see if there's interest in this chemistry. Uh, if you like it, you're going to maybe ask her out to to do something to, to get to know each other better. If you like that, you'll take it further. You might make it official. And then after a while, you might you might get married. You might have a family. But you don't say, hey, do you want to be the mother of my children straight away? Because that would be weird. And so many businesses are out there saying, do you want to get married right now? And it's like, I don't know you. And I think that's um, that's why a large part of why people distrust marketers. They are often, and this isn't always the marketer's fault, although I think a lot of fault lies with, with marketers. But quite often business leaders they put direct revenue metrics on marketing without understanding that there's a journey. And they say, just get me sales and make me profit. I don't care how you do it. Just make it happen. And then marketers often turn to shady tactics, which isn't good. Don't do that if you're a marketer. But but think about the journey, right? Are you, are you engaging people when they're ready to buy? And there are places where people are ready to buy. For example, if you go into Amazon.com, you don't want to read 100 blogs on, on how to buy this uh, can opener. You just want to buy the can opener right? So that's when someone's ready to buy it. But if someone's not even aware of their problem, maybe you should educate them on their problem. Or if they're aware of the problem, maybe you should educate them on that and how to solve it and, and move them towards your solution. Remember their journey and what they're going through and where they're at. And then you're not always going to get it right, but as much as you can, try to try to answer their problems and, and just be empathetic and support them. And that. I think is a good way to think about it. Like if you were in front of someone, you wouldn't be weird around them. Um, so don't do it online. One of the ways that I see a lot of companies doing this, hey, want to get married scenario is they're running Google ads, for example, and you click on the ad and it takes you to the home page or it takes you to the product page. They haven't introduce themselves, they haven't built a relationship, they haven't offered you something of value to help you understand how they can help you. It's just, 
pay. This is who we are. So how about you pay via check or card? What are we doing? Yeah. And yeah. that's one of the number one mistakes, as you said, most businesses have done or have made. I also heard the valuable things about not just marketing, but the ethics of marketing. Don't do shady business deals. Don't do shady marketing tactics. Don't use fake reviews. Don't post um, social proof that is not real. Don't be manipul manipulative. So if there are 10 orders remaining, don't say you only have two. Don't give fake discounts, all those things, because it ruins reputation, which really, for fact, it does give marketers a bad rep these days. I am going to put a proposal to you, and you tell me what you think. Maybe you agree or disagree. I think because so many people confuse marketing with doing Google ads and um, social media, so you post some pictures on social media, I think marketers are having a tough time because anyone can do it seemingly. And because of that, people who are not genuine, they put themselves out there, a client or two gets a terrible time with them, and automatically they start to think it's the entire industry that is like that. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I don't know about other countries, but in New Zealand, there's no regulation for marketers. There's no, uh, there's no requirements. Like if you're an accountant or a lawyer or a financial advisor, you have to have specific rules that you're bound to and there's big consequences if you break them marketers uh hold a similar level of importance in the business you're there to get customers and grow the company and they charge a similar price quite often to to these consultants but there's no laws i can do whatever i want and i'm not actually breaking the law so i think there's a bit of a regulation problem um and it may be different in your part of the world but it's certainly not here uh, the other, the other point is I, I like to think of marketing on a, on a spectrum. So on one end you have brand marketing. This is your focus solely on the brand. How do we build this reputation? How do we make people love us? Think about the Coca-Cola ads, open happiness. That's not there to generate sales. I mean, it is, but you're not going to, when you see a, an ad in the Super Bowl, they're not going to measure how many sales they got from that ad. I mean, they probably will, but that's not a direct measurement versus if it's a Google ad and they know that it costs a dollar to get this click and that they need 10 clicks to get an, an inquiry and one in every five inquiries purchases and they spend this much money, therefore that's the return on investment. They're fully focused on performance. So you can think of marketing like the spectrum of on one end there's brand marketing and on the other end there's performance marketing. And I think what a lot of business owners think is they just think performance marketing. They quite often bring in marketing when they've got a problem as if it's there to solve their cash flow problems and that's not what it is for. You should do some sales and look at your costs. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of people also think of marketing as, yeah, colouring in department. It's a, like I said before, it's, it's some pretty ads that we put out there and, you know, there's no real value in that. Um, where there is, but it's a longer term value. So I think you've got to take a balanced approach and step in the middle and say, we are building our brand, we are building a reputation and we do need to be genuine. We can't do these shady tactics. We need to think about our brand because this is the value of our company. This is the value valuation multiple when we sell our business. This is the, the equity and the capital that we're building our wealth with. Um, and what a buyer that sees a business that's on the front page of Google that's got 10,000 hundred thousand visitors a month but the same revenue is going to be a lot more valuable than one that doesn't have a website for example on the other hand if you, you don't want to go fully over you need to look at your performance you need to get return on your investment that might not be straight away it might be a delayed effect in getting returns from your marketing performance but it has to pay for itself otherwise it's not financially viable for the long run marketing is a long game investment if i want to do sales I might go knock on the doors of a bunch of businesses and get a customer in the next week. But marketing does often take longer, not always, but I think it's important just to think of it as, as that longer term investment, as that foundation, but a foundation that pays for itself if you do it right with a delayed effect. Does, does that kind of answer what you were wondering? Yeah, that's, um, that's a beautiful answer. And I like the way that you've um, bridged the gap between performance-based marketing, where you want to get results now, and um, I just say it's brand marketing, like you said. You're just getting the name out there. You're building a relationship. You're educating your prospects, your ideal customers, and 
you're letting them know that, you know what, whenever you have this problem, we are the person to help you with that. One of the most impressive ads, so you mentioned the Coca-Cola ad. One of the most impressive ads that I've done that is the Apple ad for the iPod. A thousand songs in your pocket. That was like saying, hey, you love music, we're into music. How about we give you a thousand songs in your pocket? Which at the time was huge because, yeah. you know, you had yeah. to walk around with CD players and cassette players and that got bulky and that got heavy and they got destroyed. And that's beautiful. That's amazing. And just on the note of, of Apple, did you know that Steve Jobs invented the podcast? I believe he invented it. I saw this video where he said it's like a radio broadcast that anyone can have in their pocket with an iPod. Steve Jobs did that. I believe so. Why am I not I surprised? The reason why that works with Apple is because their brand is all about giving the end user power and allowing them to push their creative edge, which is why the MacBook is so famous for doing design work. So that's also something that's pretty interesting to have learned today, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. You can think of Apple as a purely brand marketing um, I've never seen an Apple ad that's driving revenue. And maybe I'm just not an Apple user. I do love Microsoft. But uh, on the other hand, when I buy my domain name for my website, every single email is, here's a 5% discount. Can we can we convert you? Can you buy buy now? Your, your, it, it's all about, can we make money off you? And I think that's a really good example of two ends of that spectrum. And Apple is one of the most valuable companies in the world. And they've got these massive marketing budgets, but that didn't happen overnight. That's been decades of, of major investment. Um, and on the other hand, you don't want to be trying to extract the dividend every single time you can because you just lose your goodwill. That's true. And the other part is that because of that, they've built up such a massive and impressive brand recognition and audience that people say that they're a cult. But it's not that they're a cult. They're just very good at communicating their core value and their reason, their raison d'etre, like you said. The reason of being and um, Simon Sinek, Start With Why, amazing book. Yeah, definitely. So Callum, how do you enjoy your time on the Boardroom Podcast today? This has been great. You are a great person to chat with and mm -hmm. uh, you're constantly surprising me with perspectives and thoughts I hadn't considered. So yeah, I really enjoyed this chat. <laughs> how about you? Um, I... I am a student to your teacher and you can consider me educated. You also ask very great questions, which let me know that your podcast is awesome. We okay. are going to link it below. Uh, before you go, let's say that someone listening or watching would like to work with you and your agency in content marketing. How would they go about doing that? Is there a website? Is there an email? What's your work process and so on? Yeah, great. So uh, thanks for asking. I Go to pasteandpublish.com. I'll send the link below. You can get a feel for what we're about. If you like the sound of what we're talking about, you can book a free diagnosis call if you're a B2B service. And on that, I'll ask you a bunch of questions and, and tell you whether you should be doing marketing or not. And if you're not, point you in the right direction of where you should focus to grow your business. Uh, if you are in the position where marketing is right, then I can help you to grow. If you're not in that position, there's we can either connect you with people that can help or point you in the direction of education or uh, depending on your situation, we may may or may not be able to help. But I'll, I'll only provide paid services if I think that it's worth your time. Um, I think it's important to be sin a sincere custodian of what you're about. Um, when we work together, I like to think of myself as the man in your corner. So we'll hire, help you to hire agencies and teams and contractors and assistants as you need it if you need it and then train them up teach you how to be a good client because when you're a good client you get more out of your people um, install the systems the processes the checklists the cadences the ways to prioritize what to do and then as you get into doing the work depending on how you're structured because every structure is different we, we can then come along and give input, give really detailed feedback. So send me your blog draft, send me your blog, your content plans, and I'll, I'll give you feedback via videos that will show you exactly based on what you're doing right now, how to improve and why it matters so that you get the top-notch output, you get agency quality at the cost of staff, but um, you also build the skills and you have the long-term capabilities that last forever in your business. Um, and then if you're into the environmental stuff, uh, we have a podcast, my charity or our charity with my partner, Anna, is called Conservation Amplified. 
conservationamplified.org is the website. I'll send the link. And our podcast is called People Helping Nature. And we tell the stories of people helping nature, uh, some really phenomenal stories. It's based in New Zealand at the moment, but we do want to travel the world and tell stories all over the world one day. And then we take the best snippets from that and we turn them into social media content, that uh, reels and videos and, and shorts, that type of thing. Uh, and if you just want to chat and you want to connect, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So I'll send you that link too. Sounds beautiful. Sounds awesome. All those links, guys, will be in the description below. They'll be on screen whenever he mentions them. They'll pop up again right now. And if you have any problems um, reaching out to Callum, you can just leave a comment below. Our team at Zelhan will help you get connected with him. And um, we'll go from there. Cool. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure joining your podcast. And if there's anything I can do to help you, just sing out. Thank you, Callum. You've been awesome. Before you go, we have a question we always ask, given that you've had such an excellent time on the Boardroom Podcast. Who is one guest that you would like to see on the podcast in the future? And for this guest, what is one question that you would like us to ask them for you? I'd love you to have Joe Rogan on. No, I'm just joking. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. I, I could ask my mentor, Bernie Hanvey. He, he coached me for the first five years of my business. Um, mm -hmm. And a question that you would like, I'd like you to ask them would be, why is prioritizing important? And how should that fit into your business? So you would like Joe Rogan and Bernie? Yeah, yeah. I can connect you with my, my good friend and old mentor if you like and see if he wants to come on. Sure. Let's, um, let's make that connection happen and see how it goes. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll flick him a message after this and I'll see if he's interested in, in his, his availability. And uh, yeah, he's got a lot of wisdom that I've kind of just absorbed like a sponge. So I think you'll get a lot <laughs> out of it. Thank you, Colin. You've been awesome. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the Boardroom Podcast. This has been excellent. We went all around town, but we've learned a lot about B2B marketing, the ecosystem of business, and why exactly, as entrepreneurs, we need to care for the earth. So thank you guys for tuning in. Take care. Until next time. I'll feed us in.